Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Dolomite Microfluidics webinar on encapsulating the hydrophobic API in PLJ nanoparticles and microparticles. So today we'll discuss the encapsulation process, uh, the key applications, uh, and the techniques that we use to undertake that encapsulation. Um, as you may already see from the title slide, my name is Pavel Abdulkin. I'm the head of Particle Works which is the newest brand within uh, within the Black Trace umbrella. Uh, and it also forms the part of the Dolomite particle engineering team. The particle engineering team represents a completely different way or a step change in working with the customers. We are an application focused group as opposed to a device focused group. And what that means is uh, we specialize in pharmaceutical and biomedical industries. We can work with our customers from a very early stage project, uh, project uh, through all the way through their development to production and aid uh, in using the droplet microfluidic setups that we offer. So we will offer proof of principle studies. We will offer reagent kits, which are guaranteed to work with the target applications. We will specify and supply the system and system is an assembly of the Dolomite components. Uh, and we will supply protocols um, we either automated protocols or uh, protocols that customers can follow uh, such that they can target their application. But obviously, we'll support the R&D all the way up through the scale up. Uh, so without further ado, let's get in. Uh, let's get to business. Let's talk about microfluidic technology. So fundamentally, microfluidic technology is used because it enables formation of highly dispersed droplets, bubbles, gas bubbles, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and enables uh, th their formation at a variety of scales. As we shall see, you can make droplets as small as one micron all the way up to 200 micron, and you can make nanoparticles as small as 40 nanometers all the way up to uh, one micron, so 1,000 nanometers. We can form multiple emulsions. We can encapsulate uh, gas bubbles. We can form genus particles, just to name a few. Uh, and critically, what lies beyond all of this is applications. And these droplets can be used as microreactors to, for example, uh, encapsulate cells, uh, lyse them and capture RNA uh, so that we can study single cell mutations as opposed to colonies of cell mutations. So how does this technique work? Well, fundamentally, uh, the technique is centered on pinching droplets off. So it's an emulsification technique, right? So we're pinching droplets off at a junction. And unlike a batch technique, where fundamentally what you're doing is you're putting energy in into two immiscible solvents to emulsify them. Uh, if you're putting energy in, you only have statistical control over the particle size distribution. Uh, and so you end up with non-mon dispersed materials, no matter how, high, hard, how, how hard you try. Whereas with the droplet microfluidics, you're pinching each droplet off at the time, and therefore you have ultimate control over each individual droplet. And therefore each droplet is going to be made mon dispersed. The biggest advantage other than mon dispersity to droplet microfluidics is that you're putting very little energy into the process of making droplets. And so the encapsulated product, typically API or complex um, complex proteins, et cetera, et cetera, is not disturbed. Whereas with batch methods, it's typically disturbed. And so when we talk about making droplets in batch, we talk about making droplets with hate. And when we talk about making droplets in flow or in droplet microfluidics, we talk about making them with love. So the big advantage of droplet microfluidics is that you can design a chip to fulfill your need. So you can design a chip to make uh, a variety of production methods, to, to, to undertake a variety of production methods. So the easiest one to do is slugs. So all you need is a T-junction, and then you can form those slugs represented here in the top left corner in blue. Uh, and slugs are very, very useful uh, for use as chemical reactors. So for example, if you're nucleating crystals or growing nanoparticles, you might choose to grow them inside these slugs so that these particles never touch the walls of the reactor, never have the chance to nucleate on them. You can obviously form emulsions, and this is what we'll be talking about here today. Uh, and you can uh, form uh, double emulsions as well, where here we're making water in oil in water droplets, uh, and these droplets uh, can then be used for applications such as API encapsulation, in which case that would be uh, water soluble or hydrophilic API encapsulation or other applications. Uh, you can obviously encapsulate cells and we talked a little bit about this already. Uh, you can uh, undertake crystallization or undertake chemical reactions. So this is 
uh, particularly useful when you want to form gels, say alginate or agarose or albumin, where you you react two chemicals together, which would gel, but you do that just in front of the junction so that the chemical reaction doesn't have enough time to proceed before the droplet is formed. You form the droplet and then the chemical reaction proceeds within that droplet. And as I said, this is the way we form hydrogel beads, such as uh, alginate and albumin. Uh, you can um, create Janus particles where you've got two immiscible solvents, but they, the interface, the, the creation of the interface between them results in gelation. Uh, they actually turn out looking like in yen symbols, not the straight lines that you see in a diagram, but you get a general picture. And so uh, you can create a variety of methods for making droplets, but you can also uh, tailor your chips to make the droplets you want. So here in the top row, you can see five micron single reagent junction, a 50 micron two reagent junction, and a 300 micron micromix junction. And all of these are very useful for particle production and indeed for PLGA, nanoparticle, and microparticle production. And so these different designs enable us to form different sorts of droplets. So you can have straight up particles like you can see, or beads like you can see in the bottom left picture, uh, double emulsions. Uh, these specific ones are droplets of water inside PLGA beads or multiple emulsions. Um, the ones you can see in the bottom right corner are multiple droplets of water inside an oil droplet. Um, now, controlling the size of the droplet is quite an interesting exercise. So. At first approximation, the size of the droplet is the size of the junction, i.e. if you want a 100 micron droplet, your best bet is to choose a 100 micron junction. If you want a 50 micron droplet, your best bet is to choose a 50 micron junction. However, within the same junction, you can control the size of the droplet by adjusting the relative uh, flows of continuous and droplet phase. And so by increasing the continuous phase flow rate, you can pinch droplets off harder and make them smaller. By increasing the droplet phase flow rate, you can force more droplet material through and therefore make droplets larger. Uh, and so here you can see a 1414 micron junction making one micron droplets on the very left, uh, 14 micron droplets in the middle, and 25 micron droplets on the right. Uh, having said this, in order to achieve this uh, large var variation in uh, accessible droplet sizes, you need a stable emulsion stabilizer. So the emulsion stabilizer we're using here, and this system is PLGA, i.e. PLGA dissolved in dichloromethane. Uh, the emulsion stabilizer we're using here is Aquaphase, which is our own emulsion stabilizer, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, we've already talked about what happens when you increase the droplet or the continuous phase flow rate, but what happens when you increase both is you increase the droplet production rate, and eventually there will come a point of jetting where droplet formation is no longer possible uh, and you end up with one single jet. Okay, so we work at a variety of scales today uh, and typically our work is uh, around laboratory scale or pilot plant scale. So when our customers work at laboratory scale, they typically work with single junction systems. And you can see an example of uh, this here, uh, 3P pumps a microphone, uh, a microscope even, um, a, a connector and a chip. All of this is controlled uh, via software called Flow Control Center. Uh, and we're forming a single uh, stream of uh, droplets, non dispersed droplets in a single junction. And these are PLG, uh, in dichloromethane droplets with an aqua phase. Uh, and that will operate at a laboratory scale of grams per day. Now, if you wanted to scale up, you could choose to do three things. You can increase the flow rates within the same chip. You could increase the number of junctions on the same chip, and you could increase the number of chips working together. And we have a system that does all three. That system is called Telos. It's a high throughput system, and it achieves scale up by multiplex and the droplet production. So as I said, it increases the flow rates that go through the chip. It increases the number of junctions that work on the same chip, uh, and it increases the number of chips that work together. And so today with Telos, you can achieve an order of 100x scale up uh, on top of your standard laboratory setup. So Telos today can produce hundreds of grams of PLGA beads um, in a laboratory environment. Uh, depending on the bead size uh, and depending on the exact nature of the synthesis, that could be pushed to kilograms a day. 
and we certainly have customers who uh, successfully work at that scale now. Uh, we are working on systems that go beyond that, uh, but we'll talk uh, we'll talk about that later. So this is how our systems work. Let's talk about encapsulation of hydrophobic API in PLGA, and we'll do it in two goes. We'll do it in PLGA microparticles, and we'll do it in PLGA nanoparticles. So let's do microparticles first. So the typical process is an emulsification process. We would take PLGA and we would dissolve it in a solvent that is immiscible with water. And water will form our continuous phase. OK, so a solvents that we typically use are dichloromethane or acid nitrile. Dichloromethane seems to be the solvent of choice for most of our customers. Uh, so the first step is an emulsification step where the PLGA, the API and dichloromethane are brought together, uh, stirred as a uh, droplet phase. And then, as I said, our continuous phase is water, typically with an emulsion stabilizer. We use aqua phase. Academic literature uh, seems to suggest the use of PVA, and that's an emulsion stabilizer that works as well. Uh, so we would use a hydrophilic, uh, a hydrophilic chip, which would have an orifice or junction size of 5, 14, or 100 micron, depending on the uh, final bead size that we want to produce. Uh, as I said, we'll bring the API in with the PLGA dichloromethane mixture. Um, and we will then undertake what we call a standard drying process. So the beads is, uh, are formed by the process of removing dichloromethane from within the droplet. And that happens in two stages. That, uh, that happens as a result of dichloromethane migrating into water and then dichloromethane evaporating. Um, and so what you can see here in the right, on the right-hand side is droplets as being imaged on a glass slide that sits below a microscope. Uh, and what you can see go, taking place from right to left on each individual picture is more and more dichloromethane starts to leave the droplet, drying it down into a bead up until eventually you end up with one dispersed beads. Now you can take my word for it, or you can simply, or you can look at this video. This is sped up about five times, and you'll see droplets going from 86 micron droplets all the way down to 20 micron beads, uh, and this will occur. At, at the rate of about five, uh, at the rate of about five minutes per sample. Now, this is very good when you work in laboratory scale, but when you want to push it to a larger scale, uh, you'd have to use an extractor, and you can use a batch extraction process, uh, which can be as small as a laboratory scintillation vial or as large as a 50 liter uh, reactor vessel. Fundamentally, all you'll have to do there is agitate the solutions a little bit to keep the dichloromethane flowing. Uh, and provide it with sufficient air for dichloromethane to evaporate into. Or if you go into to even larger scales, uh, then you can use one of the continuous flow extraction processes that we've designed. Uh, and that works, as I said, in continuous flow uh, and works a little bit like column filtration where you've got beads, droplets even dropping in at the top of a column and by the end of the column, they dry completely to form beads. The results, um, most of our customers report, report excellent results. So the encapsulation efficiency goes from a typically uh, a typically reported 10 to 20% in the academic literature to 60 to 95% um, with droplet microfluidic encapsulation. The process of producibility is obviously very high. The API is dispersed evenly within the bead. You can control the drug loading very easily because you can splice in ahead of the droplet production junction, a dilution junction, which will in, uh, in real time adjust uh, concentration of the drug. So you don't need to do multiple runs uh, in order to adjust API concentra uh, concentration. You can simply do one run and automate the entire thing and, uh, and uh, produce a variety of uh, PLG concentrations. Uh, and you can have a very high control over the release profile as a result of mon dispersed beads uh, with very well um, packed uh, and efficiently encapsulated APIs. Um, I should note at this stage that the high encapsulation efficiency numbers uh, stem from two sources. Number one, when you're doing batch formation of PLGA beads, you will end up with a variety of sizes, so non one dispersed samples, and you'll have to go through a size selection process in order to get to your final size. Um, as the API is already encapsulated in the beads at this point, you will inevitably lose the API, and therefore your encapsulation efficiency will decrease. And the second reason is the entire process 
is very efficient in microfluidics and the API simply can't leave the confines of the droplet and therefore you get in very high encapsulation efficiency. And as I said, this is orders of magnitude higher than uh, API encapsulation efficiencies reported in the academic literature or by other techniques. Okay, so this, this was the case of PLJ microparticles, but in the case where, particularly with farm applications, where you want to achieve either solubilization of API or you want to form injectables, PLJ nanoparticles are required. And these are formed by a completely different process and this is a process of nucleation and growth, or typical pro process of particle formation. So now we're growing particles from bottom up, as opposed to uh, taking large bulk material and uh, separating the, in, into individual droplets, which we then dry. Okay, so the key difference here is that we are using dichloromethyl, uh, we, we are using two miscible solvents as opposed to two immiscible solvents such as dichloromethane and water. So typically for this process we would use acetone and water. And so our PLGA along with the API will be dissolved in acetone and will be controllably mixed with water uh, at the point where the junctions, the microfluidic junctions meet. This process is highly controlled in flow and therefore we can make very more dispersed particles. Uh, the process controlled by MIA theory or typical nanoparticle nucleation and growth. And so we could play with all the usual parameters, such as resonance time, relative flow rates of continuous and droplet phase, um, concentration, temperature, etc., etc., etc. So to achieve these mon dispersed PLG nanoparticles, we recommend two techniques. First is based on the micromixer chip, uh, which you can see to the right, and this chip is designed to form uh, turbulent flow within continuous flow microfluidics, or it's designed to deliberately achieve agitation within flow. So again, we would dissolve PLG in, uh, PLGA with API, and PLGA concentration polymer would typically be 0.25 to 0.75%. Uh, the API will go in with the droplet phase. The continuous phase in this case will be pure water. There will be no emulsion stabilizer uh, in with this phase. Uh, and then we will drop into an emulsion stabilizer to prevent uh, agglomeration of particles for long-term storage. Now, the absence of the emulsion stabilizer at the point of particle formation is a huge advantage because if you look at uh, particles that are formed in the academic literature or using standard pharmaceutical processes, what you'll find is they are agglomerates or mixtures of PLGA and the emulsion stabilizer as the exposure to the antisolvent, water in this case, results in the nucleation of both PLGA and PVA. Now, that's not terrible, but that reduces, substantially reduces the control over the release profile and that substantially reduces the control over the particles because you're forming, there's no control over the composition of individual particles. So particles on the outside tend to be PVA rich and particles on the inside tend to be PLGA rich. And so the entire process loses its control as well as mom dispersity of the particles. So here we've got pure water as the antisolvent and we're able to form pure PLG nanoparticles with the API inside which we can then stabilize and coat which isn't a problem at that point uh, at the uh, output of the reactor. Now the advantage of that technique is the fact that you've got pure particles. The disadvantage is that you're limited to a typical uh, PLG particle size of 100 to 200 nanometers. So you can make very mon dispersed incremental PLG particles, but you're limited to a size range of 100 to 200 nanometers. And we find that 80% of our customers, uh, for 80% for of our customers, that's exactly where they want to be. However, in some cases, particularly in academic cases, our customers want to make uh, particles that are smaller or larger than that. And for that purpose, we have, what, uh, we have another technique, what we call a three-phase technique. Now, in this technique, we typically use a uh, 3D pore junction, and we typically use a hydrophilic or a fluorophilic chip. We would also mix uh, acetone PLGA with aqueous environment. This case, in this case, containing the motion stabilizer, either aquaphase or a PVA solution would work. But the difference is, we have a third phase, which is a fluorocarbon oil phase, which we send down the sides of the reactor. 
And so what happens is the particles nucleate and they uh, and they uh, and they and they form the PLJ PVA agglomerates and, and they flow down. But that can sometimes block the reactor because these particles have to stick to the walls of the reactor. But because we've got fluorophase streaming down the sides of the reactor, coating them perfectly, uh, we can separate we can separate that out and create can create sheaf flow within which our particles can grow and nucleate. And that's proven to be very effective, as that technique enables us to use much higher concentration of polymers, so 0.5% to 2% this time. This is PLGA, obviously. Uh, it enables us to use minute quantities of fluorophase. You only need fluorophase to just lubricate the walls a little bit. And fluorocarbon oil is immiscible with uh, either acetone or uh, the aqueous environment, and therefore separates itself out at the bottom and can simply be uh, and can simply be run off. Uh, and it will it is guaranteed to not interfere with the PLGA particles. Uh, and so the results the results look great. Uh, so first of all, uh, in both techniques enable you to substantially tighten up the size distribution. As you can see in the top left image, the size distributions that typically achieve um, in forming PLGA nanoparticles us, uh, leave 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 a lot to be desired. Uh, however, forming the particles in PL in in droplet microfluidics enables you to substantially tighten those size distributions up, uh, meaning that the release profile is far more accurate, and uh, you avoid any surprise down the end. Uh, we can produce these particles um, consistently uh, with no intervention for periods of five to twenty four hours without a problem. We can have droplet flow. Uh, set to uh, anywhere between 50 and 500 microliters a minute. So that's half a milliliter a minute droplet flow uh, flow rate. And with micromixing technology, as I said, we can access sizes between 100 to 200 nanometers. Uh, and with the three-phase technique, we can uh, access sizes between 40 and 800 nanometers quite easily and maintain that moment dispersity, as you can see from the DLS traces on the right. Um, so just to recap, the advantage of the micromixing technique is that it's an e it's a very user friendly technique. It enables formation of pure particles with no coating on the inside, no no mixing in of any other polymers, um, and it enables you to um, create uh, create particles within the 100 200 nanometer range. The advantages of the three phase technique is that it it's a, it substantially expands the range of particle sizes that you can make from uh, 100 to 200, all the way up to 40 to 800 nanometers, um, and it uh, enables you to throughput much higher concentration of particles, up to 4x the concentration, uh, at whilst maintaining the relative flow rate. So all of the applications that we talked about are fundamentally enabled by reagents. What we find is when customers use our, uh, our systems, uh, but end up using their own uh, reagents, the results uh, tend not to be as good as uh, as we achieve in the lab. And so to bridge that gap, we released our own reagents. They're called Aquaphase. This is an aqueous-based emulsion stabilizer. Fluorophase, that's a fluorocarbon oil emulsion stabilizer. Uh, and these are available on the website now. They form very stable emulsions. Uh, they enable washing of the beads or particles that are formed. Uh, they are obviously compatible with all of our microfluidic equipment. They are biocompatible and they're washable, and they're highly effective, inexpensive uh, materials. So please have a look at these. They're available on the Dolomite Microfluidics website. So with that, let's jump to some conclusions. So we've demonstrated techniques for making PLG micropoles and nanoparticles. There's a total of three techniques uh, that have been demonstrated. Uh, they enable access to PLG particles in a size range of 40 to nanometers to 30 micrometers. In each case, microfluidics enables reliable production of highly modern dispersed particles. And in each case, uh, the materials uh, can be uh, the material fabrication can be scaled from laboratory scale, where we're making grams a day, all the way up to pilot plant scale, where we're making kilograms a day using the Telos system. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and go to questions. <laughs>